Um, so welcome everyone, thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to be doing a sort of question and answer panel today um, to help you with everything archaeology related. Um, so I'm Beth, um, I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for Wessex Archaeology. Um, so that means my job is basically to go into schools and go to events in the local community um, and teach people about archaeology. Um, at the moment that's on Zoom and webinars and things, um, but usually we're going into schools and doing lots of fun stuff with chocolate and sweets and stuff. <laughs> um, but we'll stick with Zoom for now. Um, I'll just introduce you to everyone that's on the call with us. Um, and then they can talk a little bit more about their jobs, um, their student lives, everything like that. Um, and then after everyone's introduced themselves about half past, we'll open it up and you can all ask any questions that you wanna ask. Um, and I've got a few questions to ask as well. Like I said, it's being recorded. So if you do miss anything, you can watch it back later. Um, it should probably be up uh, sometime next week on the CBA YouTube channel. Um, I will put a link to that at the end as well so you can find it. Um, so we've got on the line, we've got four people that are my colleagues here at Wessex Archaeology. So we've got Tom Westhead, who is um, a photographer here, um, does all photographs um, of events and artifacts and sites and everything like that, um, and videos. We have Olivia who is a project support officer, and you'll find out more about what that actually means uh, when she's having a chat with you later. Um, we've got Isabel, who is a geomatics assistant supervisor, and again, she'll explain more about what that actually means later. Um, and then we've also got Sam, who is the community and education manager, um, who is my manager, um, and he also basically similar sort of stuff um, about teaching people about archaeology and doing webinars like this. Um, and then we have three other people who have some kind of connection to archaeology. So we have um, Charlie, who is a current student at Sheffield University. Um, we have Hayley, who is another current student at the Arts University Bournemouth. Um, and she's been involved with us this past year. Again, she'll talk more about that later. Um, and then we have Tabby, who applied to volunteer with us. Um, she's an ex-student as well um, and she'll talk more about volunteering and how to get into jobs and things in the in the sector later on. Um, so should we get started with Tom? Do you want to introduce yeah. yourself and tell us a little bit more about what you do? Sure, um, thank you Beth and thank you to everyone joining us today. Um, my name is Tom Westhead, I'm the photographer and videographer at Wessex Archaeology. Um, I've been in the role for almost a year now. Um, Photography and videography or archaeology are not things that I studied at university. Um, I actually graduated in law uh, back in 2011. Um, when I came out of university, it was obviously just after the financial crash and things like that, and there weren't too many jobs going about in law. So I did some odd jobs, and then eventually got a job in law and did that for about three years, but found that it wasn't what I thought it would be. It was sitting at a desk for 10 plus hours a day. Uh, there wasn't too much variety in, in terms of what I was doing. Um, and there's a, there's, a, there's a real difference between studying law and practicing it um, in reality as a job. Um, so I'd always been interested in photography and film, probably because my dad used to be a manager of Odeon. So I was always interested in film and things like that and, you know, visual media. Um, so I decided to just uh, go for it. And I'm completely self-taught. I didn't really attend, uh, you know, university or anything like that for photography or videography. It was just a case of like trying to take a hobby, something that you love doing and trying to make it into a job. Um, and I've been very fortunate. It's taken me on a, on a pretty, pretty good journey that I'm grateful to have had. I've been to Canada um, and worked as a professional photographer in the Rocky Mountains, which was great covering events uh, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then when and then in, obviously in your spare time, go do landscapes and wildlife and things like that with with people, which was great. Um, and when it was time to, to leave Canada and come back, I was looking for a role that wasn't something like uh, shooting fashion or anything like that to me. I wanted it to be something that helped to uh, disseminate information and educate people and include people. Um, and so I applied to the Wessex Archaeology while still in Canada and got the job. Um, and I've got a really varied workload at Wessex Archaeology. So as uh, Beth alluded to earlier, it's uh, you know taking finds photography, 
um, site photos. We've done partnerships with uh, Butzer Ancient Farm and things like that, who are experimental archaeologists. Uh, working with people like Haley, uh, I'm sure she'll come on to talk about what she, what she's she's been doing, which is great. Um, TEDx Salisbury, you know, uh, going to science fairs and arts festivals and things like that, and covering them with photography and video. Um, working with people like Phil Harding, which is pretty life's just interesting how it works out because I used to watch Time Team um, back when I was a kid. It was like a sign that school was the next day. Uh, it's just weird how life works out. So yeah, it's very varied, uh, very interesting, um, and I'm and I'm learning every day about about archaeology and things like that. Thank you, Tom. Um, we'll move on to a current student. So Charlie, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Charlie. I've just finished a degree in classical and historical archaeology at Sheffield. Um, I came into archaeology after doing English language, economics and history at sixth form. Um, and I really loved history, but I couldn't see myself working inside in a desk for, for forever. Um, and I want to do something more practical. And I felt that archaeology could offer me that. And I chose Sheffield Archaeology at Sheffield because I wanted to, and I still want to work professionally within the field. And Sheffield really helped pay for a career in that. And there are modules perfect for field work and things like that. And there are also opportunities to work on excavations with members of staff. Um, I've been able to work on some really exciting sites whilst I've been a student um, recently at an Anglo Saxon cemetery where I excavated four adults who are all buried with various jewelry and beads and um, it's been a site that's been featured on the BBC's Digging for Britain. Um, and I've also worked abroad with Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich, where I was working with a team of German students on part of a Roman town in the Bavarian countryside. Um, but it's not all digging, uh, and a degree in archaeology isn't just about working in the field. There are plenty of opportunities available afterwards. Uh, you know, there's loads of people here doing all sorts. Um, and through moving to Sheffield, I found the city that's really, really fun. And it's full of great independent businesses, coffee shops, really great beer, and of course the Peak District. Um, I'm also lucky enough to play for the Peak District as well. Um, and for anyone, managing your time at uni isn't, isn't the easiest, um, but between uni, friends and a job, you soon manage and get, learn to get the habit of it all. Um, in terms of what I'm going to do afterwards, uh, actually at the beginning of the week I actually applied for a job with Wessex, um, hopefully soon I'll find out how that's gone. Um, but if that, hasn't, if that isn't or won't be successful, I've been exceptional to an MA course in the department to study archaeology and heritage. Uh, a topic I connected with throughout my final dissertation and final year. I think you muted there, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to go now as well? Do you want to introduce yeah. yourself? So hi everyone, um, yeah, my name's Isabel and I work in the Geomatics Department at Wessex Archaeology and uh, what that basically means is that I deal with all of the survey data that comes from the fieldwork teams. So when the fieldwork teams are out excavating, working on archaeological sites, they use certain bits of equipment to obtain um, GPS information, so um, kind of like the information that you get on your phone. Um, from uh, satellites and um, yeah, like satellite navigation, GPS info. Um, and they use certain bits of equipment to survey in archaeological features on site so that we know where those archaeological features are spatially um, and we can tie it all in with all the other aspects of the site recording process, basically. So my job basically is to process and interpret that survey information and to create plans of that um, we work really closely with the field teams because obviously they need to know you know which part of site they're working on next where they need to go what they've excavated um, so yeah we're always having constant dialogue back and forward between them between us our, our two departments um, and we also work closely with the graphics department as well um, because we do a lot of um, 3D modeling, laser scanning, um, techniques that involve um, making uh, visual information out of data, um, like 
photographic data, um, video data, anything like that really. So um, yeah, we work quite closely with a lot of, a lot of departments at Wessex Archaeology. Um, and um, yeah, if any of you were in the photogrammetry session earlier, then that's just one example of, of what we do in geomatics. Um, so when I was at school, to be honest, I didn't really know a huge amount about archaeology at all, really. Um, I did a geography uh, degree, firstly, which um, because I was kind of interested in landscapes and um, how things form and why things are as they are um, in the land in the physical landscape. So I did that first. And then when I finished that, I um, went to study a master's um, in bioarchaeology. So I was mainly focusing on human remains and um, burials, cemeteries um, and osteology. So the study of um, bones and um, ancient remains basically. And then it was kind of through that that I got into archaeology because I always been interested in it. Well, as I learned more about it, I always I became really interested in it and wanted to pursue a career in it. So then I um, when I finished uni, I got a job with a commercial company um, and I started working in the field basically and that's that's where I started. So um, before that point, before I started working for a commercial company, I didn't really um, have much experience of working in field archaeology, so working on archaeological excavations. I'd done a few kind of research digs while I was at uni, um, but that's quite different to the commercial environment. So I think um, yeah, you kind of have to sort of adjust to work in a commercial setting. It's quite different to a research setting. You know, um, you often don't have as much time if you're working in a commercial setting. You've got quite tight deadlines. Um, things are done in, in quite a different way sometimes. The kind of the fundamentals are the same, but it, yeah, I, I kind of, you have to sort of learn a lot basically. Um, so yeah, I worked in the field for quite a while and then I went to um, work for a different company and I worked in the heritage sector. So what I found was, really good about that was that it kind of um, brought all of the kind of knowledge and skills that I'd done sort of in my degrees and the field work and kind of brought it all together and I was writing um, reports to kind of go alongside the planning application um, because the commercial sector is heavily tied to kind of the um, development um, sector and then uh, yeah and then I um, so I worked in that for a bit and then I came and joined Wessex as a to work in the geomatics team so this is a slightly different area again so I've kind of done a few different things but always kind of within archaeology and um, yeah I kind of find that it kind of all builds together and creates quite a nice it's nice for me because I can kind of um, what I enjoy about my job now is that I can see um, kind of from like the comfort of my own desk as it were lots and lots of archaeological sites all across the country because we have regional offices and we work across all regional offices so I'm based in the Maidstone office but we work on projects from all the offices and that, that's really nice being able to kind of see the um, spread of work and the different types of work that we do as well so yeah. We'll go back to students. Uh, we'll go to Hayley, who can tell you a little bit more about how you got involved in archaeology this year. Hi everyone. Um, so my name's Hayley. Um, I've just graduated from uh, the Arts University of Bournemouth this year, um, and the course I've just finished is uh, Makeup for Media and Performance. Um, I specialise kind of in the application and making of prosthetics um, and special effects makeup. So kind of your gory bits and bobs you kind of get. Um, and uh, I kind of find it really fascinating looking at anatomy and being able to change kind of um, the face and the shape of the face and the body um, using prosthetics. Um, and Wessex Archaeology first approached my university in January saying that they kind of wanted to find a new way to express archaeology um, and how makeup would be a good way to do this. Um, and with sort of my interest in anatomy and kind of wanting to um, further my research in sort of different fields, um, I kind of jumped at the opportunity, it sounded really exciting. Um, so we decided that we were going to create an educational short film that's going to be sent um, around schools along with loan boxes um, with sort of little artefacts and costumes and things from different eras. Um, and we decided to look at a, a case from the late antique Roman era, so kind of 200 to 300 AD. Um, and there was one case in particular um, from this archaeological dig that really kind of caught my eye. He, um, 
he'd experienced lots of um, war wounds that had healed over time. And by the time the case had um, died, uh, he had the wounds had healed. Um, and kind of that process was really interesting to me to kind of discover how these wounds had healed. Um, and working alongside Tom, who you spoke to earlier, um, sort of just looking at how to create a short film, being able to show the process of his life and how he would have lived through these injuries because they were quite significant injuries. So sort of living through such life-changing injuries and how his life would have changed. Um, unfortunately, because um, we're online and everything now because of coronavirus, um, the film originally we were going to do in, in um, April and it's obviously had to be postponed. Um, but we're, we're going to try and pick that up as soon as possible. Um, but it's, it's been really good to sort of work alongside the Wessex team. It's been nice to have sort of leading research that can help um, sort of um, help my course because it's, it's a completely different thing that I'm looking at archaeology and makeup. It's completely different, but they, they come together really nicely. Um, and it was really nice to have that research like throughout my last project and my degree, um, really like fundamental. Um, and just kind of, I wanted to sum up just to sort of, this, you think that prosthetics and archaeology is, it's not something you think they're worlds apart, but they're actually, art makeup's a really good way that I've found is a really good way to express archaeological findings, because you can sort of, you can reconstruct the past um, and particularly for a younger audience for kids in schools. Um, it's such a good sort of visual medium to be able to show them how people would have potentially looked like and how um, they might have lived. So yeah. Brilliant, thank you Hayley. I think that's so true. It's, it does make a difference when you can actually show someone what you're trying to talk about instead of just kind of trying to imagine it. Yeah. Um, and if anyone does want to have a look at what Haley created, it is on our social media, so you can go and have a look because uh, it's very cool. <laughs> um, so we'll go back to Oestix Archaeology now. Olivia, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hiya. Um, my name's Olivia. I'm a project support officer at Wessex Archaeology. Um, it's quite a vague job title. Um, I will kind of go into a bit more about what I do when I give you the roundabout route of how I got there. Um, I studied Anglo-Saxon, Norse and Celtic uh, for an undergrad degree at Cambridge, um, which is essentially looking at um, the history, literature and languages of the people of Britain, Ireland and the Scandinavian world in the early and Middle Ages. Um, I sort of didn't want to just do history at university and I quite liked that it was quite a lot of flexibility within the course. Um, and I could also take papers from English and archaeology. Um, and I took uh, Anglo-Saxon archaeology. It was my first real kind of insight into archaeology I'd never really done it before definitely not at school um, I thought it was really really interesting I thought oh maybe I'd like to pursue it a bit more as a career however uh, at the end of the year we went on a field trip and I don't really know what I was expecting doing Anglo-Saxon archaeology we were definitely not going to have two weeks in Greece but uh, I had three rainy days in Suffolk um, which was brilliant and um, it was it was a lot of fun we did find some really really interesting things but it just it really hammered for home to me that I probably wasn't cut out for a career in field work. Um, it, it wasn't really right for me. I just found it very interesting sort of from a theoretical point of view. Oh, Olivia, I think you might have just muted yourself. Um, sorry, I think I muted myself. Um, I think that was the end of a, uh, the idea of a career in archaeology for me. Um, I didn't, um, didn't know there were other, other jobs um, within the sector. Um, I didn't really do any extra research into it at that point. Instead, I sort of fell into a job at a digital marketing startup. Um, again, didn't really know what that was either, but I, I kind of gave it a go. I thought it would be a good opportunity to learn some new skills um, and kind of develop myself. It ended up being a really good experience for me. Um, I managed a team. I ended up uh, working on some big digital projects with clients, um, spent some time in America, opened up a new office. Um, but it also just gave me over three years the chance to really speak to other people about what they were doing with their jobs, um, find out what other jobs were available. Um, I thought I was sort of pigeonholed at this point. I was, I was a digital marketer for life. Um, but, you know, it turns out loads of people are ch chopping and changing with jobs definitely early in their careers. Um, and you pick up all sorts of skills that are directly relevant to other job roles and sectors. Um, 
so yeah I sort of started looking at, at other things and uh, I still had this love of archaeology I was sort of vaguely doing a bit of volunteering and and reading on the side um, and I stumbled across Wessex um, initially just trying to find an event that I could go to to maybe ask them some more questions like the one that um, ones that Sam and, and Beth run all the time um, maybe do some volunteering and I, I found the project support officer job on the website um, yeah, it was a bit of a vague job description even then. Uh, it, was a, it was a new role that they put together um, and they sort of said it might, it might change. They didn't know what it would look like. Um, so part of me was a bit nervous about doing that. You know, what, what would I actually be doing? Um, another part of me saw it as an opportunity to see um, what it would be like to work in commercial archaeology, see what jobs were available, um, work with a lot of people who are really passionate about what they're doing um, and, and see how the job would change as, as it sort of needed to needed to um needed to change so i took the job obviously and um started out just primarily helping out the project managers um so with their when they run their projects they need some support sometimes with um financial uh, implementation invoicing um other administrative things um working on timesheet hours all of that kind of thing um but i've ended up doing quite a lot more than that usually um i help out the um, chief, uh, the, the COO, um, reviewing contracts on a, on a daily basis. They come in from new, uh, new clients, new projects. Um, I help out with financial um, analysis for the CFO on uh, sort of executive meetings and things like that. Um, I do help out with uh, community engagement events sometimes. Sometimes they just let me tag along for a jolly, but sometimes I do help. Um, uh, but there are also lots of opportunities. I think that the one of the main things I'm really enjoying with my job is the the other the other stuff that I get to do. So, um, for example, the, the, there are lots of opportunities to visit sites um, and visit, um, yeah, visit visit the archaeological sites. It's kind of encouraged, actually. It's definitely for sort of business support and and finance. They don't don't often get a chance to see what's going on. So, um, yeah, definitely, I, I went out to to one site in Somerset and the, the site manager gave me a whole a whole tour of what was going on, what they found, what they were discovering. Um, it was so, so interesting. And ev even within the office, when you when you walk around, um, there's, there's such a buzz of what people are working on. So actually just before lockdown, I, I wandered into the finds room, see if anything interesting had been found recently. And someone just took 45 minutes out of their day to show me some skeletons, um, explain how they knew things about each one. Like I, I don't have that kind of osteo background and and they were looking at them and telling me one was a male of a certain age with certain diseases and, and they could tell me how he died and it was amazing to me and then it's great that you have these people with such skills and knowledge that are happy to just sit down with you and and discuss it during the day so yeah I think I'm, I'm glad that I took the time to to do the research and it doesn't really matter where that comes in your career I think there's there's always time to chop and change definitely I mean Tom Tom is a lawyer now he's a photographer there's there's a, there's a you know a lot of opportunity to the change within your career and it's just about finding out what's out there and taking opportunities when they come definitely brilliant thank you Olivia all right should we move on to Tabby hi so I'm Tabby um I've just left Bournemouth uni um where I'm supposed to be graduate well I was supposed to be graduating in November but now it's March so We'll see what happens there. Um, I did a BA in archaeology. Um, when I was younger, I didn't really want to be an archaeologist. I always wanted to be a, a war correspondent and or a journalist or something. Um, but I went through clearing um, and I ended up going to Bournemouth to do archaeology. And I think it was one of the best decisions I probably ever made um, because I've always loved history, but being able to do archaeology as a degree, it's taken me so much further than just history and books and things like that. Um, I've always wanted to get more involved with public engagement and education, things like that. So I started volunteering at the YAC, which is the Young Archaeology Club, the Young Archaeologists Club. Um, so I do, I work at the Dorset branch. Um, but obviously since lockdown started, everything had to go virtual. Like we didn't have a choice with anything. So I started emailing museums and um, asking if I could do any volunteering for them. Um, and so at the moment I volunteer for not only YAC, but other three other museums as well. So I do the social media, um, write articles for them, edit things for them, a lot of sort of data analysis for Excel spreadsheets and things like that. Um, but I've, yeah, I've, since lockdown started, I've been trying to really boost my CV because 
obviously I've got some field work experience and finds processing and things like that but I think one of the best things about events like this is that you can get ideas of how you can sort of develop yourself in things that you know you might not even have thought of you know online courses or um sort of just going to digital events like this or just emailing and phoning people and asking what they think what their advice is um especially for cvs as well so if anyone has any questions for cv or volunteering advice i can i could try my best <laughs> i think yeah that's it <laughs> All right, thank you, Tabby. Um, so we'll open it up. So if you have any questions that you want to ask, um, either specific people or just a general question, um, you can start typing either in the chat or you can ask in the Q and A. Um, you can also raise your hand and we can unmute you, so you can actually kind of um, speak your question if you'd rather do that rather than type it out. Um, but yeah, now is your chance to ask any questions. Um, Sam, do you want to talk a little bit about your history as well, just while we're giving people a chance to type out their questions? Because um, one of the interesting things is the difference between how many people have come from an archaeology background and how many people did something completely different and have ended up in archaeology. Um, so do you want to talk a bit about your background, Sam? Yeah, um, absolutely. So um, I'm Sam, I'm Education Community Manager for Wessex and whenever I introduce myself I, I always tell people I, I make no pretense to being an archaeologist. Um, Beth brings the archaeological expertise to our team. Um, I actually trained as a primary school teacher and I always wanted to be a teacher. My dad was a teacher and I like talking with people. Um, so I trained as a primary school teacher and then I arrived in primary schools and I hated every minute of it, um, which was a bit of a shock. So I thought, oh dear, what, what can I do that involves teaching that doesn't involve all the constraints of a formal education system? And I happened to be volunteering um, at a local museum at the time, and they were looking for an education officer. Um, so I applied for the job and I got the job, which was good. And so then that's how I started 13 years ago now in heritage and museum education. And it's taken me to all sorts of places. And I've never been an expert in any of the subjects I delivered. So um, I was head of education for the lifeboat, the RNLI, um, I can't actually swim. Um, and I was delivering a life-saving programme teaching children to swim, which was quite ironic. Um, and again, I worked for the National Jazz Archive in London, um, and I, I don't know anything about jazz, but my skill really is making things interesting for people. Um, and it, I don't need to be an archaeologist. At Wessex, I work with, I, I'm biased, but I'd say with probably 200 of the best archaeologists in the country, I don't need to be an archaeologist, I just need to take their knowledge and make it interesting for someone who's eight or 80 or has dementia or uh, ten, use archaeology to improve someone's life somehow. So um, don't by any means feel that when you're coming into archaeology you have to be an expert on something. We need lots of different skills to make the company work and I've been working very closely with Tom for the last two weeks and Tom's produced some amazing video content for us and something I couldn't do it's something that no one else in the company can really do so we all we need specific skills to make the company work um, so yeah don't be afraid to do the things that you love and go for jobs where maybe you're going to be pushed outside of your comfort zone and I, I wanted to pick up on particularly what Tabby said I, I made a note actually about volunteering and volunteering is so valuable and don't think of volunteering as working for free think of it as a free opportunity to work for great organizations where you can stack up stuff on your cv and i'm sure it was tabby i had this um, conversation with actually and i said you know when you volunteer if you're volunteering at a museum or any organization get get a project that you can own something that you can take control of so that when you can when you apply for jobs and you're sitting in interview and someone says, and Beth and I did this for our colleague Natasha when we interviewed for her back in October, you know, what, have, what thing have you taken ownership of and delivered that was your idea and that you, was your inception that you made happen? So volunteering is really, really valuable. Don't underestimate it and don't underestimate the opportunities it will give you to expand your career. So yeah, that's all I'll say on that. Absolutely, yeah. Um, just to say again about the volunteering, I'm sure Sam heard this in my interview actually. Um, but when I, so I did archaeology at university um, and when I left, I, I sort of knew that I wanted to do community engagement, but I didn't really know how to get into it. 
Um, so I started volunteering at a local museum. Um, and the, the first thing that I helped them with was their Halloween event um, where I dressed up as a skeleton um, for a kiddie event where they, they shut all the doors in the museum and the, the kids had to go around and trick or treat. Um, and then there was another one where I was dressed as the Beast of Marston Moor and we were doing a, a sort of a tour around the museum but we were all acting in different characters and I had to go around and scare people in my uh, Beast costume. Um, and then the first interview that I got actually, um, which is the first job that I got outside of uni, um, was at the Museum of Science and Industry in Manchester. And it was for an explainer, so that was, again, it was like talking to people, explaining um, different parts of science and industry. Um, and one of their questions was, you know, like how, how, where have you got the confidence to kind of speak in front of people and do things like that? And the first thing that popped into my head was acting as the Beast of Mass and War in, in this Halloween event. And I, I, to this day, I, I'm convinced that that's what's got me the job. Um, so that within two weeks of volunteering, I already had great experiences um, that helped me get jobs in the future. So absolutely, um, volunteering is so worth it if, if you have the opportunity to. Um, so we have a few questions come up. So the first one that we got through, I think, was uh, from Ellie. And it is, is there anything I can do to see if I like archaeology before I take the course at uni? Um, I, 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 I was going to contribute here a bit and say, Ellie, I think, um, you know, you can see from the people um, we've got on screen that um, archaeology, there's digging and then there's a lot of stuff w which isn't digging. Um, and as far as I'm aware, um, Charlie might be able to elaborate on this. And for as in terms of what we do as a company, commercial archaeology isn't covered in great depth at university. Um, and it, you know, you, you say if you like archaeology, there's so many different aspects of archaeology. So we've done a lot of environmental science stuff um, in our sessions earlier today. Um, and the environmental science team, I don't think any of them came in through an archaeology route. They all came in through ecology and environmental stuff. Um, but if you want to get into digging, there are organisations you can work with um, to sign up for digs. At the moment, it's very, very challenging. Um, one of the best things to do is to look for the UK's commercial archaeology companies. So Wessex is one of many commercial archaeology companies in the UK. But quite often we take on contracts where... We, we have to have volunteers digging on site. It's part of the developers um, kind of tick boxes that they want to see volunteers on site. Um, so there's companies like us and there's others if you Google them um, and they'll often be advertising for volunteers post COVID around the country. I'm sure other people can add to that as well. Beth, you muted. Does anyone have anything to add there? Um, so um, I actually had the same question before I went to university um, because I originally wanted to do forensic anthropology um, and I found that archaeology was a route into that um, but I, like, like you I wanted to find out if it was something I actually enjoyed um, and I did volunteer on um, a dig in York um, so I'd say if, if you're looking to volunteer on a dig, find one that does, um, gives you more experience outside of just the, the kind of digging part of it. Um, so we got to talk to a few different specialists um, in like pottery and things like that. Um, and there was another exploration that I went on where we had someone come in to talk to us about arrows and um, what arrows can tell us and stuff like that. So I think find one that has other opportunities in with the, the experience as well rather than just that. Um, also one thing I'd add is if you're if you're interested in archaeology the things you might be interested in might not be labeled as archaeology for example if you enjoy experimental things like uh, metal working or think you know crafts things like that it won't be necessarily labeled as archaeology but it will be incorporated into archaeology experimental archaeology so I think it just depends on what kind of part you're interested in and then you've got to go find that part because if you're interested in you know fines processing or something it's it's very different if you're interested in public engagement so I think you've got to try yeah work at that kind of way. Yeah. 
Um, we'll move on to another question. Um, so we have an interesting question from Caitlin, which is, if you wanted to study mythology, what path down archaeology would you go? I didn't know you could study that, actually, I must confess. Um, I remember like it being... Academia. Something um, you go into academia wise. Maybe more I'd, like I'd classics say. or something like that. Yeah. Like joint degrees, can't you? Like archaeology and classics. I don't know whether mm -hmm. it's something like that. I'm not, I'm not sure. It depends what kind of mythology as well. I did a paper that was on sort of medieval magic and things in, in English literature. Uh, I mean, there's loads of random papers you could do. I'd say partly for this question, part for the, partly for the last one, do loads of research into what what actually the modules are that you'd be learning in different degrees and what 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 things you could be reading about all the time and then try and find you know they, they often have reading lists attached and you could read the the one at the top and see actually if you'd re if you'd enjoy learning about um that kind of thing yeah so it's it's a good idea to look um as olivia was saying at the the modules that they'll actually do in the course because even the ones of us who have studied archaeology i would assume that we did very different modules um, so I was at Nottingham and we did a module in underwater archaeology but that's just because we happen to have a lecturer who specialised in underwater archaeology and I know a lot of people have never done that at uni um, so it's definitely worth looking at the actual modules that they teach um, and have a look at the lecturers as well what their specialisms are because that's likely what you're going to be learning about um, Okay, we've got a question from Emma, which is, do you recommend a history or an archaeology degree or a joint degree? Um, I'd say that a lot of unis will, if you do archaeology, they'll let take history modules as well. So I did some history modules in my first year, even though I was an archaeology student. We have history students who do archaeology modules. So it really, it probably depends on kind of things like entry requirements and things like that. And some, I know some unis are flexible, they'll let you swap courses a certain amount of time into your first year if you, you know, you've done some of an archaeology module and you've chatted to people and you think actually history and archaeology is not for me, I want to do full archaeology or you decide but you want to get rid of archaeology and just do history. Mm -hmm. But there's also, like we've said so far, there are plenty of people here who've done something else and have still ended up in archaeology. And there's plenty of people who've done archaeology and done other things afterwards. So your degree doesn't entirely kind of mean everything, what you, your, your options are afterwards. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's a similar sort of thing. So I'd say definitely have a look at the modules and things like that and go for what you're going to be interested in and what you're going to be willing to put the effort into rather than being worried about the title of the degree. Because um, if you do something that you necessarily don't enjoy, um, you're not going to get as much out of it as doing something that you know you're going to, going to enjoy, but it has a different title if that makes sense yeah and i guess as well like archaeology I, I think this is what this session is showing that how broad archaeology is it's such a broad subject so i think don't feel like you need to limit yourself um just because say for example a certain degree has archaeology in the title because actually the things that you're learning and the skills that you're learning could be often be applicable even if they're not deemed archaeology it's kind of like what tabby was saying earlier um so yeah don't necessarily feel you have to limit yourself like that um, we have a question about international applicants, um, which is, what is the scope for international applicants slash students, particularly considering the present situation? I, I was, sure I was going to add something to that one. Um, so the, at the moment, uh, some commercial archaeological companies will sponsor people through um, uh, visas, um, some won't. However, because of the extent of upcoming major infrastructure projects in the UK, um, as companies, we understand that there aren't actually enough archaeologists in the country to do the digging if all of these kick off at the same time. Um, so within our company, certainly, and some other organisations, there are talks to try and get archaeology listed as a specialist or a shortage specialism, um, which will open up better opportunities for um, workers from around the world to come and um, support archaeology in the UK. So that, that's kind of a watch this space thing at the moment. Um, hopefully that answers your question. If you want us to add anything else about that, just uh, um, ask another question. 
Um, we'll move on to another one, which is from Liam, which is, is it possible to become an archaeologist without studying a degree? Um, for example, is there an apprenticeship route? Um, and if so, what age would that start? Um, yeah, so we have plenty of people um, who are field archaeologists and non-field archaeologists um, who didn't do a degree. Um, there are, like we said, there are so many different roles within archaeology that there are so many different ways to get into it as well. Um, as for apprenticeships, I'm not too sure about that. Is there yeah. anything I, I can I can jump in with that one. Um, so there is in the new government apprenticeship guidelines, there is an archaeology apprenticeship. Um, so the foundation is there for it. But currently, to my knowledge, no company is offering it at the moment. Um, but it's something we might do in the future. So but at least it's been recognised by the government as a subject that you can do an apprenticeship in. Um, that's for the academic based apprenticeships. Some companies will um so big companies when we take on uh, big projects part of our remit or part of their remit is that they have to employ local people and upskill local people and certainly hs2 the big railway line that's being built at the moment they have a policy of um, taking on apprentices and um, now it's all been made very difficult by covid but again um there are some major infrastructure projects coming up in the country where employing apprentices is part of the planning permission for those um, um, pieces of construction to take place and it's likely that archaeology companies will be offering apprenticeships for those in the next couple of years. Entry points I think it's likely to be 18 plus um, I know the government offers some at 16 but it's likely that it will be 18 plus um, within our sector certainly so I hope that's helpful. And going back to volunteering as well, getting the most experience you can is probably the best route to do if you don't want to go to university. Um, you can, I know on a lot of uh, research digs that I attended at university before, um, some of the like trench supervisors and stuff had just, they had got the job because they'd had so many months experience on a dig rather than their experience at university. I don't know if you found the same as well on your, on the digs yeah. that you went to. Yeah, so I did, um, like one of the digs that I was part of a research dig, they actually um, took applicants from the local community where the dig was as well. So, um, you know, that could be people from the village, because it was in a small village, or, you know, people from the local university. So it doesn't necessarily have to be, even if um, the research dig is being run by a uni that's um, completely in a different location to where the dig is, if you see what I mean, they often put opportunities out um, for local groups to get involved as well, because that kind of builds into part of their remits and, and what they need to kind of um, meet. And also it gets the local people involved as well. So yeah, things like that is worth looking at. Uh, we'll move on to another question. Um, do you have any advice on how to get a job in archaeology that's more advanced than a shovel bomb, i.e. specialist? Um, so I guess, Post university, um, specialising. Does anyone want to jump in on this one? I guess if you can do um, well, I guess it depends. Maybe if you if you can or want to do a specialist, like a master's degree or something, that can be often a way in because um, often I think with the specialist roles, it's about proving your knowledge and experience so you don't have to have a, a specialist degree necessarily if you've got lots of experience so I'd say if you're kind of interested uh, in becoming for example um, a pottery specialist or something then I guess um, try and get as much experience both maybe in the field and also um, in post excavation as well in finds processing things like that so that you can when you're kind of going for those roles you can demonstrate that you have kind of a a depth of, of knowledge and experience really that would probably be my um, thing and like even things like you don't actually have to um it doesn't necessarily need to involve um going out on sites and things necessarily but you know if you're kind of interested in that and you're doing lots of reading in your own time and looking at articles i would say if you want to be a specialist in something then you want to be kind of looking at articles that are kind of at the forefront of what's the research where the research is going right now I think and just kind of keeping on top of what's going what's happening in the sector and, and stuff like that really. Yeah definitely I'd say it's probably also worth kind of reaching out to people that you know are in that area as well mm -hmm. um, and asking them questions. Um, we'll move on to another one um, 
Does anyone have any recommendations for PhD applicants for recent, sorry, for recent uh, PGT graduates? I don't know if anyone here has actually got a PhD. No, and it, it's a it's a really tough market. Um, uh, yeah, occasionally, um, occasionally opportunities come up for sponsored PhD placements, but they're quite rare within a commercial archaeology. Certainly, so the only ones I know of are either at research organisations or at universities, um, but they're quite rare, as far as I'm aware. Okay, um, that might be something worth. Uh, contact us about afterwards so we can yeah. have a chat with some of the people about that. Um, we'll move on to a question from Imi. Um, you've been told that you needed to take geography at GCSE and A-level which you weren't able to do. You took history, R in English language um, and you were told that you couldn't do archaeology at university. <laughs> I, in my opinion, definitely you can. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think definitely. probably if we all said RA levels, it'd be a completely yeah. different <laughs> subject. Um, I, I, in my opinion, you don't need specific A levels to do archaeology. No. Should, should we I mean, go through and say what RA levels were? <laughs> yeah, go on. That's <laughs> a good I mean, idea. I need to remember. <laughs> I mean, um, I did English literature, English language, and IT. I think. I did uh, chemistry, maths, and geography. Yeah, I think I did geography, chemistry, uh, and English. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> I did um, history, politics, and German. At a level. Okay. <laughs> Liv, I did um, history, French, and Spanish, and I went through clearing as well. So to me, I. I I can't believe that. I've never heard of something like that before, I'll be honest. <laughs> I was just going to ask whether it depends, I mean it probably really depends on the individual courses but also because there are quite a lot of different types of archaeology courses aren't there? Are they BA mm. and BSc and like archaeological mm. science courses? Like, I don't know if some of them require different things. Yeah so I did the BSc um, but there was plenty of other people doing the BSc that didn't do any sciences at A-level. It, it mm. just the only difference that it made. So where I went to in Nottingham, they had a BA and a BSc. The only difference that it made to the course was that I had to do um, osteoarchaeology, um, environmental archaeology, and I think it was metal analysis. Um, and then I had options to do like Roman medieval and stuff like that. Whereas on the BA, they had to do the Roman medieval courses, and then they had an option whether to do osteo and stuff like that. So I was doing the exact same course as someone on a BA just because we happened to choose the same modules. So it, it, to be honest, it doesn't make that much difference. You can kind of make it what you want it to be. Um, what about Charlie and Haley? What have you guys done at A-level? Um, I did economics, English language and history. And I know that for most, I think, no, if not all the archaeology courses at Sheffield, there are no requisite A-levels, even for the sciences or, you know, any of them. It's, Whatever levels you've got, as long as you've got the right grades. Yeah. And Claire, um, <laughs> sorry, just to say as well, Claire um, from the CBA is able to comment on the position regarding PhDs. Brilliant. If we want to bring Claire in. Um, Hello. <laughs> Hello, Claire. Hello. Um, yeah, I've been lurking in the background watching. Um, but yeah, um, I'm Claire. I'm the development manager at the CBA. Um, and I thought I'd hop on because um, I did my PhD um, at the University of York. I finished a few years ago now. Um, but I would, I think there's two, there's two really important things, I think, um, when it comes to thinking about doing a PhD. Um, the first one is to really do your research into um, the subject that you want to study. Um, you're going to spend three years, if you do it full time, of your life um, studying this one very specific thing. Um, and it's, it's a very different experience to doing a master's. Um, I would say it's a lot more intense, it's a lot more focused, um, and it's brilliant. I absolutely love doing it and I would certainly recommend it. But it is, it is something that does become your life for those three years. So it's really, really important that the subject that you pick is something that you feel you can really 
get stuck into for three years um, and really, really kind of embrace that as a topic and enjoy it. Um, because otherwise, I think it, you know, it could be really, really hard work um, to, to, to get to the end. So that's, that's the first thing. And I think the, the, the best way to really know that it's what you want to do is to try um, where you can to kind of, you know, speak to speak to people who are already working in that area, studying that area um, and really spend time kind of, you know, asking them questions about what they do, how they got there, um, asking them for sort of reading material and that kind of thing that you can, you know, really get to know that topic well. And also, you know, if, if there's opportunities to do any sort of field work or anything um, associated, if that's relevant, um, if there are ways that you can do some volunteering in relation to that subject area in advance, I would say that's a really good thing to do as well. Um, and then the second thing I would say is, um, you know, really research the place that you're going to do it. Um, so um, I think it's, it's really important, again, that you're going to have um, three years really close contact with um, quite a, a select group of people within the university um, in terms of um, who your supervisors are um, and who you're kind of working with. So you really want to know that you're going to be able to get on with those people, that you can work with them, that you can um, you know, sit in a room and have a really good back and forth conversation um, and debate about, about kind of different elements of your work. So you've got to feel really comfortable with those people. And I think, you know, again, that, that comes down to kind of trying to meet them in advance, having conversations with them to make sure that, um, you know, you, you feel that, that that relationship could could work and could be productive for you. Um, and similarly, kind of look at the um, what's on offer with each of the universities as well, um, so that you've got kind of all of the other elements that you need in place, whether it's um, if it's a scientific based um, PhD you're doing, you know, make sure they've got really good labs that are going to be able to facilitate the type of research that you want to do. Or, you know, make sure the library's kind of got the right kind of stuff and you're not going to spend your whole life traveling to the other end of the country trying to find the material that you need. Um, so, yeah, just make sure that all of those kind of things are there. And also look at the student community as well, because, again, it is a, it's a really intense thing to do. And so you want to know that you've got the support that you need there from your peers as well. So do they have a really good kind of um, postgrad community that you can get stuck into? Um, so I think they're kind of the, the key things, really, I would say. I know it's I know funding is really difficult. Um, you know, Sam touched on it before, you know, trying to get um, get a funded PhD can be really difficult. Um, but I do think it's important that rather than go for a funded PhD because it's got money with it attached to it, um, I don't necessarily always think that's the right thing to do. I think it's more important to make sure that PhD is something that you're really going to enjoy doing. Um, whether you go on to do something in your career with it afterwards or not, um, three years is a really big chunk of your life and um, you want to make sure that you really enjoy them. So yeah, I think that's it. Just while we're talking about PhDs, there is just another um, question. Would you recommend to try for a PhD if you want to be an archaeology lecturer? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, you don't have to. I would, um, you know, I know, I know um, quite a lot of lecturers who have had different routes into um, into that path um, through working in archaeology in different facets. Um, through heritage organisations, commercial units, etc. But um, a lot of um, lecturers do tend to um, have gone down the path of doing a PhD. The really great thing about doing postgrad um, study is that most departments will give you the opportunity to um, do some teaching um, through that process. So you actually will, alongside your PhD research, will have opportunities to um, learn the skills in terms of sort of teaching. Um, and there'll be lots of kind of opportunities for career development there. So it's certainly a really good way to, to, to test the waters, to find out if it's what you want to do or not. I thought I did. I tried it out when I was doing my PhD, decided I didn't. Um, so, you know, it absolutely is a really good opportunity to, to be able to, you know, to try out, you know, what's it like having to mark a whole, you know, kind of year group's essays, um, you know, in a really short space of time, or what's it like, um, you know, standing up in front of a, you know, massive lecture room to, to do a delivery um, or run a small tutorial. You know, there's, there's opportunities to do all of those things while you're doing your PhD. Yeah, thank you. And, uh, I wanted to um, pick up on another point Claire made about um, accredited degrees. Um, I was going to maybe, I was going to, Beth, can you share a screen or maybe I can share a screen? Yeah. Um, 
because there are the in the chat link chat um there is a link to CIFA, the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists, and oh, yeah. the degrees that they accredit. Um, and that's really useful. So that means you come out of a degree not just with a degree with archaeology, but with an affiliation and membership of CIFA. Uh, that's really useful for us. So as an employee, when we, as an employer, when we recruit field archaeologists, that's one of the things that's quite helpful to have because we know that the person applying has met a certain um, number of standards. And the other thing you can get once you're a member of CIFA is you can get something called a CSCS card. Um, and the CSCS card is, oh, here we go. Here's a list of accredited degrees. So those are all the places that um, CIFA accredit, if you're thinking of going into um, archeology span professionally. Um, and then with your CIFA membership, you can get a CSCS card, which is for working on construction sites. So any one of our team who works or carries out work on a construction site needs a CSCS card. Um, and that's something you can get before you apply for jobs in archaeology. And if you, when you apply for a job, if that's something you've got, it kind of says to us that you're ready to go. Well, we don't need to give you further qualifications. We don't need to further train you up. Um, it makes you a very attractive offering um, for field archaeology. And the final thing I was going to say on that note is um, get a driving license. It's really, really valuable. Um, don't underestimate how important it is um, when applying for particularly professional archaeology jobs um, to have a driving license. N none of us here could do our jobs if we weren't able to drive and whether it's you know Beth and I driving out to events or Tom heading off somewhere to photograph something or our field team heading out. Um, one of, Quite often for some of our sites we dispatch five to ten people at a time and we need a certain proportion of drivers to drive people to sites and the more drivers we have the more flexible we are as a company. So um, yeah, driving license and CSCS cards are two strong things in your armory when applying for jobs. Yeah, I'm very aware of the time at the moment. So if we just try and quickly run through a few more questions. Um, and we would pick up on, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. can we pick up on Eleanor's question? Um, because she asked something quite, um, uh, quite on point actually about, can you specialize in a particular area or area in archeology, span e.g. Roman pottery? Uh, oh my goodness, yes. Uh, so Roman pottery is a massive, massive shortage area and yeah. pottery specialists in general are an enormous uh, shortage area for us. And normally when we advertise jobs, we'll get between 20 and 60 applicants for posted in the company, my own and Beth's included. Um, when we advertised for our pottery specialists last year, we had four applicants. Um, it is an enormously shortage area. So Eleanor, absolutely you can specialise in it and you'll be very sought after if you do. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we also have a question, would an archaeology degree help if you want to work in a museum or would a different degree be better? I know it's a bit vague. Um, it, to be honest, there are so many different types of museums, yeah. but it's, it completely depends on your interests. Um, I've worked in a few museums that have been kind of history and archaeology based, but I had colleagues who did like chemistry and biology and all sorts at university. Um, so again, it goes back to do what you're interested in, um, do what you're passionate about, and then um, go from there. Um, I think there are plenty of museums that wouldn't be related to archaeology. Um, so again, it just depends what you're interested in. I'm just putting a link in the chat to an organization called GEM. So they're another organization um, I work with, with another hat on. Um, so GEM is the kind of the official organization that represents museum education staff, um, but it's a really good organization, them and the MA, the Museums Association, of course, yeah. as well. Um, yeah. Two memberships that carry a lot of sway when applying for jobs in museums. Yeah, brilliant. Um, a question about our volunteering opportunities going online in the UK. Tabby, have you you've started volunteering online? Yeah. So basically, they've all been forced into it pretty much. They've had to adjust quite quickly, um, and they're doing overall a lot of the museum association, especially, are really spearheading helping museums form things online. For example, the Salisbury Museum in Wiltshire, they've just launched an online exhibition all online using artifacts from their own museum so I think it's just a thing of you've got to send out emails and phone calls to people in museums talk to people ask about volunteering you know experiences and say to them what skills you have whether you have 
you know, digital skills or you're good at, you know, communication skills or you could do coding, things like that. Um, I think that you've just got to ask really and, you know, go after it and good luck with it. <laughs> We do, we do um, have, um, we do take volunteers at CBA as well um, and a lot of our volunteering opportunities can be done remotely so um, do um, get in touch if you're interested in, in doing something. Uh, probably the easiest way um, if you email festival at archaeologyuk.org and that will come straight through to me um, and I can put you in touch with the right people and tell you more about it. Yeah it's always worth asking. How can you best increase the range of experiences and skills you have in fieldwork in the current environment? Um, Joshua is applying for his first commercial archaeology jobs, but obviously fieldwork experience has currently been cancelled. Um, any advice for fieldwork experience that's online? Um, go, go on. Um, Isabel, you're probably best place to answer this than me. Um, well, obviously, it's quite difficult at the moment, as you say, uh, with not really many sites running. But perhaps one thing that would be useful is if you go online and look for resources that explain the methods and procedures that are used in archaeological excavations on site. So things such as um, learning about stratigraphy, learning about um, doing scale drawings and plans, learning about using um, GPS systems. So um, whether that be uh, a dumpy level or an actual GPS kit, um, an electronic kit, um, anything kind of like that, that you can learn about so that when you go out, when you do get the opportunity to go out in the field that you can say, oh, you know, yeah, I've, you know, I understand stratigraphy and I can I can apply that you know I can use this bit of equipment and for certain bits of equipment like certainly for the GPS GPS and things like that you can actually download online software and there's lots of tutorials as well so you can actually learn online how to use those bits of equipment and that is really really useful because then when you go to work on the site you, you can you can already do it basically you might have to learn you know every company is slightly different so you might have to learn the way that different companies do it but if you have the basics there then that that's a really good start and that can be something that you can do without actually being in the field and then you can build on that when you are able to go back out as well um, <laughs> um are there any courses you'd recommend doing during the summer um i've actually been doing a couple of online courses about different areas of archaeology um, there's a website called Future Learn, and they have they have courses about everything you could ever imagine. Um, but they do have archaeology specific ones. So there's one that's about archaeology in general. Um, I did one about forensic archaeology. Um, there's one that I'm currently doing that's about health and well-being in the ancient world. Um, they have loads. You can there are two different options. You can do it for free, but you can only access the course for a certain amount of time, or you can pay and you can access it for as long as you want. Um, I've just been doing the free ones and they're really interesting. So definitely have a look at Future Learn. Um, I've just popped a link into the archaeology ones in the chat. We do have um, on the CBA website, we have um, some briefing pages as well, which um, do, um, at the moment, they're pretty bare, I have to admit. Um, but we do, when, as and when volunteering opportunities start to come about again, kind of in terms of getting out and doing field work, um, we will advertise them on our website. Um, so anything that there is kind of um, that we're aware of, um, mm. that, you know, it's a good place to sort of check and find out. Um, and also, if there are if there are local groups and societies in your area as well, you know, get in touch with them because often they're crying out for extra people to help. So when they are kind of getting back on their feet again, um, you know, do you do you get in touch and see if they're doing any field work? Because a lot of them do 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 field work and a lot of them do offer training as well. Um, I just noticed one that was asking about what is the youngest you can volunteer? Um, if you are under the sort of general volunteering age, as Sam said it here is 16, um, do you have a look into the Young Archaeologist Club as well? Because yeah, um, they have a lot, lot of opportunities um, and you can see if you go onto their website you can find the nearest club to you um, and they do all sorts of things so definitely have yeah. a look on that. Um, have a good time. Oh, sorry. sorry. I was just going to say I think making contacts is quite a good yeah. way 
um, getting involved with with things as well because so by volunteering at say the app groups or the museums it's all about the different types of people you'll meet and then you can often hear about opportunities you know or you can't might find out about things that you you probably you might not be able to find out online because you know you're having a conversation with someone so a bit of networking is, is always good as, as well <laughs> and, yeah, and, definitely, I'm glad um, you said that, that, that was on my list I wrote earlier because one of my first <laughs> was yeah a, a network is really really good and as Isabel said, knowing people never hurts. And because, you know, the more people you know, the stronger your position. Archaeology is a small world. <laughs> yes, <laughs> really is. Yes. Um, so even like someone like um, Hayley, who's on this call, she, although she, you know, hasn't done archaeology at university, um, you know, you've created some really good work and we, there's every chance that in the future, if we want something similar doing again, that we could get in touch with her. Um, so even if it's someone that's not in a field that's related to you, if you have that contact, you never know what's going to come up in the future as well. Um, that is if Hayley wants to keep working yeah. with us. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool, Wait, okay, can yeah. I just follow up? There was a follow up question from Joshua about um, if it's going to take a little while to, to find the right place to do a PhD and to get the funding secured for that, how to keep your academic career moving forward. Um, and I just, I, I would say the, you know, there's, there's a couple of really obvious things there. One is, one is volunteering, um, you know, anyway, all the things we've been talking about, about ways to enhance your skills, um, develop um, your knowledge and, and really be able to, um, when you are putting together your applications for your PhD and once you're, you're, you've got one in kind of, and you're there doing it in terms of being opportunities to, to do teaching and training within the department, you know, if you've got really good skills that you can show, you can evidence because you've been doing them already. Um, I think that's, that's a really good, good thing to have. So, so volunteering for sure, but also, you know, you don't, you don't have to have a PhD to, to write. If you want to do academic work, there is nothing stopping you writing articles if you're doing some particular research at the moment you know be, be, be confident be brave and, and get in touch with different journals when um you know keep an eye and see what they're what, what they're putting out in terms of calls for papers um and don't be afraid to submit something um and similarly you know apply to conferences as well um you know you can build up a really good um catalog of kind of experience presenting um, and, and written work um, through through conferences and journals and um, a lot of conferences these days do have bursaries for students so it's a really good way to to get started mm -hmm. um, outside of the commercial field what are the chances for visa sponsorship i.e museums heritage and non-profits it's um it is really really tough um and just speaking from experience, I, I worked in a museum where we we had our conservator, but we lost her because we couldn't put together a strong enough case um, to keep her, which when her visa ran out, which was really frustrating. Um, but I think uh, I think when I typed an answer to that question, I said the thing to do is specialise, and the more specialised, the more focused you are, um, the easier it is for the organisation to prove that there is no one else who could do that apart from you. Um, and that kind of goes back to the pottery specialism as well the more yeah the more specialism and the more specialist you can be um stronger your position we've pretty much covered everyone's question if you have any last minute questions type them in now um if not i will just put up um a poll for you to answer um just uh as a little bit of feedback just so we can um see if you enjoyed it if you thought this was kind of um enjoyable for you and did, if you learned anything from it um we'd really appreciate it if you could fill in that poll it should be up for you to fill in now um we've had one last question any chance for traveling worldwide definitely yeah i think yeah um i don't know whether you've heard of the erasmus scheme um i, I it's a scheme that's run and it through Grampus Heritage, which is its own organisation in Britain. Um, but Bournemouth Uni, we've done lots of digs in association with Erasmus. And so I went to Portugal on a fully funded dig for a month. And it was amazing. I mean, all my a lot of friends went to Bulgaria, Romania, Ireland, Finland, France, loads of places. Yeah. <laughs> and even as a um uh, commercially as a company we we had before lockdown we had staff over in uh, Germany, New Orleans, um, Iran, uh, Tunisia, 
um, Turkey. We've done some interesting work um, a bit under the radar rescuing stuff from Syria, um, which has been quite interesting. So yeah, absolutely. It may not be places you necessarily want to go, but <laughs> you can go to some interesting places. Go where the archaeology is. Yeah. Um, even outside of commercial as well, I know a lot of lecturers at um, my university had digs abroad. Um, some of my friends got the opportunity to go to Crete and do an excavation there. I was similar to Isabel, I ended up in Wales for a rainy two weeks, but some of my friends had a great six weeks in Crete in the sun. Um, so yeah, there's plenty of opportunities out there. Um, it's just finding them. Um, I think most people have answered Paul now, so thank you for that. Um, I hope you've all enjoyed it. If there's anything that you think of after the session ends as well, feel free to get in touch. Um, we're all on so various social media um, to find us. We're at Wessex Arch on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, everything pretty much. Um, and you can find uh, links to CBA as well if you want to have a look at their websites and get in touch. Um, does anyone have any last words to add before we finish? You've all been brilliant. Thank you so much for helping and answering all the questions. Um, it's been really interesting, even for me, even though I know you all. <laughs> it's <laughs> nice to find out more about you. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for joining us and we'll end there.